Today we're talking about planning the 2023 garden, so thanks to Buckerfields too for providing me seed catalogs from West Coast Seeds. And Sue has brought some other things as well. Um, after, towards the end, we are going to ask Michael to just to bring up um, an important topic towards the end about Wise Women Seeds and Sarah Bradshaw. So please, uh, right at the end, we'll, we'll open up to Q&A and then we're just going to give Michael a little bit of time for that too. And I just want to draw your attention to the fact that the Shoe Shop Food Action Society is hosting our annual fundraiser for the coldest night of the year. It's February 25th. And so I have some information on the side. Um, so if you have questions, I have a letter that tells you what it is and how you can participate. And it's a really good community building, family friendly event. So um, Sue Moore here, she was with Notch Hill Organic and Nursery. She used to own, she used to, to grow food on 14 acres, right? Organically, and she produced a lot of food for the community. She decided to sell it and go on to the easy life, moved into town. But of course, once you start growing food, you can't stop. So she has, she's giving us her mentorship and her time with the community teaching garden, which we work with uh, the Family Center in North Broadview, and we grow food communally for the community. So she provides us with you know, our crop rotation, she grows seeds for us, she provides us with those organic seeds. And then also is an incredible workhorse, and she comes in, she gets her done. <laughs> and I come in behind her and smooth it all out. <laughs> so it's a, really, it's a really good relationship. So we thank her for providing us with her time and for teaching as well. She, she's now taught quite a few courses. And I'm sure she'll come again when it comes to the actual seed starting classes, which uh, we can do outside in that case, and we can actually get our hands dirty too. So thank you. And um, enjoy the class. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yay. Well, thank oh, you. Oh. And I'm sorry. If you do need to use a bathroom, there is one here at Buckfield. We go down these back stairs, and it's in amongst all the shelving of their, their stock. <laughs> thank you all for coming. And yes, we're going to talk about this year, but starting to talk about this year, we have to look at what we did last year. So, show of hands, who had a garden last year? Oh, about more than half. Fabulous. And you need to think about, before you start this year, you need to think about last year. Was it big enough? Was it too big? What kind of disease problems did you have? Can you control them? Were you disappointed? Were you happy? Did your family hate beans? <laughs> whatever, whatever. So we start, we start by looking at last year's garden. And if you have any questions throughout, I do like to do a Q&A at the end, but for clarity, I'll also take questions all the way through. So just, you know, pop up your hand, okay? So with the issues of last year, did anybody have pest issues? Yes. Yeah. And do you know how to deal with them? Yeah. No. Some of them. <laughs> so there's a, there's a couple of things that you can do. One is that one is to, hopefully you've identified your pests. <coughs> Two is to just Google how to take care of them. And three is to just not grow that crop next year. So, of course, the third one is the easiest one. But there are a lot of things that you can do for most pests, except flea beetle. That's, I think, what it was. Because it was the cabbages yeah. and the broccoli yeah. and the kohlrabi. It the was just like, yeah. and, like oh, and yeah. they were little black, little black. Okay. okay. Is that's, that the flea beetle? That's flea beetle. That's what I thought. And if you have a small garden, flea beetle is really, really difficult to deal with. It lives in the grass, it lives in the chaff, it will come back next year. Um, with a commercial farm, anything that we wanted to have free from flea beetle, we, we tilled a huge swath around the, around the beds, planted the seed, 
covered it with a protective cloth and prayed. So flea beetle is the most difficult thing to deal with. However, if you can cut it down, your food is still edible for your family. You're not selling it, you're not taking it to market. Even if you were, some of it you pay for by pounds, so it doesn't really matter. Yeah. But anyway, so flea beetle. Sorry, just back on the flea beetle. It lives in the grass, so to try and prevent it, just get rid of any grasses around the garden? Any grass, any chaff, any anything. If you're lucky enough to have a, a, a garden surrounded by a you know, brick walkway or a gravel path or something like that, you, you that's where you have your best success to get rid of flea beetle. Okay. Uh, our problem was a lack of insects, no bees, no pollination. Okay, so so no pollination. Now, one of the, this this is one thing that I used to talk to other farmers about, because um, monocropping in farming used to used to be a, a big thing, and monocropping in farming is, as we all know, a bad idea for many reasons. But one of them is pollinators. What I always suggested to farmers was that they give up a small area of their, of their growing land and plant flowers. You need, you need your flowers early in the spring to get the bees and other insects coming. You need them in the um, main part of the season to keep them coming and then in the late part of the season to sustain them um, for food for their, for their winter, um, whatever process they have for overwintering. Um, you can grow a pollinator garden. And, you know, if I was a bee and there was all these beautiful flowers over here and all these beautiful flowers over here, would I go down to that one zucchini flower <laughs> you know, zucchinis are not everyone's favorite, and um, you know, bees do not go to flowers in isolation. If you do have a problem with pollination, you can pollinate your own plants. So with 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 uh, with the squashes, it's really easy. You just find your male flower, take its skirt off, and run around and pollinate your female flowers. With other plants, it can be more difficult, but a lot of the vegetables we grow are also self-pollinating. So that's not so much of an issue. Anyone else have pest problems that we can run over quick? Ooh, I had slugs, like these little white things. They were awful, and they were eating my cabbage, and yeah, I, had slugs I too. used the ear to Them, just didn't take care of a yes, yes. Uh, previous life I used ducks, but if that's if that's not a um, soil's not very difficult. Um, beer is ideal. Will they come back here? They will. They 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 have a little tiny white iridescent egg, kind of similar to a frog spawn. And part of getting rid of slug is, is the same as getting rid of um, your flea beetle, is keeping a hygienic garden. Because the slugs lay their eggs in the, in the uh, fall, and they overwinter in the ground, and then they hatch out in the spring. So early control is really, really good. And Although a lot of people are trying not to, not to till and not to disturb their garden too much, quite, quite often that that's what it needs, is, is a disturbance to get those eggs, to let them dry out. If you see them, squish them. Some flowers with your garden to feed them. Yeah, right on. So, 
once, it, once you've thought about your last year's garden with regards to pests, you need to think about it with regards to crop rotation. Because one of the things that um, harbors pests is the, the, the same crop being in the same area. And um, that's really specific for things like root maggot and um, carrot rust fly. That's always a problem. So once you've thought about your pests, think about your family. What do they want to eat? Are you planting the right things? Did you plant too much last year? Did you not plant enough? And, and just think about that and, and prepare your brain for, for you know, not planting that 500 foot of lettuce. So, yeah. Question, let's go back to rotating crops. Um, so where we planted potatoes last year, get them out of there and put them somewhere else in the garden, is that what you mean? Yeah, potatoes are a low feeder. Yeah. So you want to put them in a low feed situation. What does that mean? It means it means you don't want to put a huge amount of compost into your ground and then plant your potatoes. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, so there's a, there's basically three types of when you when you when you're thinking about crop rotation, once you've thought about your pests and and where you don't want to plant certain things, you have to think about your soil. And there's three types of crops. There's a, there's a heavy feeder, mm -hmm. there's a low feeder, mm -hmm. and there's a nitrogen fixer. And it's really easy. The best thing to do is to plant a high feeder, lots of compost, lots of additives, a nitrogen fixer, mm -hmm. or a low feeder. A nitrogen fixer, it's gonna fix lots of nitrogen, no, Sorry, a high feeder, a low feeder, don't prepare, don't put any compost into your soil as long as you had a reasonable crop out of it last year. Mm -hmm. And then a nitrogen fixer. And the nitrogen fixer is your beans and your peas. Um, the best nitrogen fixer I know is a broad bean. They're fabulous. Next year, you just move everything over one. Oh, okay. Okay? Yeah. So once, if, you're, if your garden has um, a similar uh, water level, mm -hmm. you know, you don't have to deal with this is underwater in the spring <coughs> or etc. If you have a nice flat area, you can determine one, one, one. If you've got a big garden and you're growing too much food, you can do one, one, one. And then your fourth section would be a cover crop. And the cover crop helps to, to prepare the soil for the next year. So, so you don't grow anything for a year. Helps to stimulate your worms, your micro um, activity. And, and is really good for, for the soil. So you can do four. But if you've got a small garden, just take care of those three. And any suggestions for cover crop? It's all according what's what's uh, what's the problem. I like um, uh, I like uh, uh, full rye. Full rye holds nitrogen and gives you a great big um, <coughs> clump of roots, etc., etc. Um, and that's a that's a good cover crop to take uh, to actually just put in in September and then dig in in March. You don't have to give it a full year. If you if you need something that's going to give you um, more nitrogen. Um, a winter pea, um, followed by um, a, a fava bean of some kind, will give you a section really, really high in nitrogen. Vetch is good for putting in a, um, a, um, a for putting in a nitrogen. Oats. If you're into no-tilling, the section that you had your high feeders in, you could put oats into. In the fall, they'll grow, they will die in the spring, and then you can just make holes and plant, you know, your squash or your broccoli or other large transplants into that area. And, and that also helps. The, the oats um, helps to suppress weeds. 
the um, non-tilling, um, digging of the garden helps to promote your, your, your worms and your beneficials in the soil. And so there's, there's all different kinds of cover crops you can use for all different kinds of things. If you have a problem with cooch grass, oh, oh, yeah. do we have a problem with cooch grass? Oh, yeah. I have gotten rid of acres of cooch grass in one year. So what you do is you do an early, for me it was a tractor and a tiller, but you do an early dig over in the spring when the ground is really dry. You know, when if, if you get a really sunny spring, this is your best premium time. You do a dig over, you wait three or four days, you plant a really heavy planting of Buckwheat grows incredibly fast. It will um, smother the cooch grass. It will smother other weeds. And it's allopathic to cooch grass. Allopathic? Doesn't like it, kills it off. It's, it's part of the, um, the theory of um, companion planting. Some plants are allopathic, evil to other plants. Buckwheat is evil to cooch grass. So you let your buckwheat come up and flower. As soon as it's in flower and before it's in seed, you cut it into your, back into your soil, let your soil dry out, and put in another cover of buckwheat. It takes a whole year, but it really gets rid of cooch grass. And the other thing is when you're weeding, don't leave your cooch grass roots on the soil to dry out, because they really won't. Mm. Put them, put them in a bag, put them in the garbage. Don't put them in your compost. Okay, good luck guys. <laughs> in terms of um, weeds that get a heck of a hole, um, have, what do you do about purslane as a weed? I have it everywhere. Well, it's edible. <laughs> yeah, I can never possibly eat as much as my garden grows in a thousand years. The, 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 the theory is, is if you have an annual weed that you allow to become a really heavy problem, it takes up to seven years to get rid of it. Yeah, and it's not a huge problem in that it doesn't suppress my plants at all. It's just, and I want to control it before it gets worse. Okay, with purslane, does everyone know purslane? It's, it's, um... It's probably in your in your salad section of your catalog. Um, it's a, it's a, a gelatinous water loving. Page thirty seven. <laughs> Some people plant this. I can't believe people plant that. They just know that you have to So with 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 purslane, the easiest thing is if you have a, a real problem, is to really concentrate on one area if you don't have time to do everything. But if you have time to do everything, even better. Pull your purslane out, turn it upside down, and let it dry out. Get it before it flowers. And so this is another topic we obviously need, is edible weeds. Yeah. Because it is one of the only plants that's high in the end. Yeah. Oh, what? Hi, what? Oh, it's very nutritious. It does make lovely salads. You know, I love salads. Start selling it. Yeah. I actually used to sell it. So, now, 
then, so now you've now you've decided yeah. that you don't want to grow parsley as a crop. But you haven't decided what everything else is that you're going to grow as a crop. So this is a, this is your time. Decide what you're going to grow as a crop. What your family will eat. And a little tip here: if you're new to gardening, only grow what your family is going to eat. <laughs> And if you're a first and second year gardener, only experiment with one crop at a time. Because you really do want to get 90% of your crop out of your garden. And if you grow something that unexpectedly gets consumed by bugs or your family finds disgusting or whatever, you really don't want to be wasting your time. It's so disheartening to, to have a crop that doesn't grow for you. So once you've decided what crops you want, you also need to decide who is going to do the gardening. What is the other things you're doing the gardening for? Is it to spend time with your kids and to teach your kids? Is it to get grandma out there and off of the couch? What, you know, like, what is the, what is the, 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 um, per, the secondary purpose, if, if any, of your garden? And then you can decide, well, I grow everything in the ground, but grandma can't get down on the ground anymore. So maybe we should put in half a dozen big pots or a raised bed or, and think about that before you start your garden because it's, it's quite disheartening um, for some of us to kind of get shelled. So once you've planned, you need to plan your supplies. So if you're going to, um, if you're going to attempt to protect from flea beetles, you need to look up Remake. And West Coast Seed sells it. And so does William Dam. Remay, R E E M A Y. And there's two different products. One is Remay, which can be used as a pest protection early and late in the season, as a frost protection early and late in the season. There's very little that you can grow under Remay all season, except for salad turnips, which really, really need protection. And they will grow under Remay all season. And they probably sell that at Silagro, is it called? In the industrial park? Mm, maybe. Okay. Maybe. But you may have to buy a 450 foot bowl. Yeah, Sue, I'm just going to say, too, like, Barkerfield sells it. Oh, okay. Uh, they sell it in rolls of at least 50 feet. They have, there's also the width, and that's another thing that you want to make sure you get right. Make sure you get enough width. Yeah. If you're going to have hoops over anything that you have, like, there's six feet wide, which is far more convenient than trying to fiddle around with four foot and clipping it down, and the wind just picks it up, and it's gone. So it is really good for season extension. Though. Yeah. One of one of the one of the th I think the, the width that's a really good point because on the farm we used to we used to have a couple of acres under this product but we used to do it all in single strip width. You'll see some farms have massive great big squares of stuff, but because we were such a mixed operation um, and because we wanted to um, be continually planting so that we had a staggered staggered harvest. All hours was done in single width. You have to. We had to leave enough room for about six inches. The height of the crop, the width of the crop, the height of the crop, and six inches. And that six inches, we um, totally covered with soil, so that there was absolutely no possibility of bug penetration. We never used hoops. Part of the reason for using hoops is um, 
in the summer if you're gonna if you're gonna have rimei, for instance, over um, peppers, over your sweet peppers in the summer, they're actually going to burn if you have the rimei touching the fruit. So you really do need to put hoops over something like that. With the other product that we used to use, we also used to use it um, straight on, onto crop. And it's called ProtectNet. And all it does is protects your crop from insects. We again used to use it without hoops, but we also used to use a size smaller mesh than recommended. Because what would happen would be your carrot rust fly would, would buzz in, and your carrot would be underneath your protect net, and the rust fly could still smell it. So it would lay its eggs on the top of the protect net. And if your mesh is too big, those eggs are going to fall through. So we always use the smallest mesh possible on our protect net. But those flea beetles, same thing, because they're so tiny, right? The flea beetle is the same thing. If you're going to try and protect from, um, from flea beetle, you need to use the smallest size protect net you can get. Okay? Um, I don't know if Buckerfield's carries protect net. No, and I, what I would suggest is that um, because Sue introduced us to this product, which is what like Wildlife Farm uses this product. So big organic operations use this, and they get you know thousand foot rolls, and that's what they use, and that's how they grow their food. And so we bought some for the community teaching garden, and we bought long rolls because it's more cost effective, and then we cut it to our length. And I think that if people were interested in this, we could get your email, and then we could do a bulk order, yeah. and we could order some. It is coming from Ontario, and there's a shipping cost, but it's, you can look online at William Dam, it's called, and they will sell to everyone, and you can just uh, you know buy however much you need. But if, it was, if you had a small quantity, I think we could probably do something where we order together. The, the other thing is, is if you happen to be a market gardener, and you want the bigger quantity, the, the company who supplies it is Dubois, and they're in Quebec. So you need to ship out to Quebec. Oh yeah, yeah. it's quite durable. It's not perfectly durable, you still have to be careful, but it's yeah. quite durable. It, it, should, it should last you a minimum of three and up to 10 years. Is it like a cloth or is it a plastic? It's like a tool, like a fabric, like a very fine, okay. drapey right. kind of fabric. Yeah, okay. and it, 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 it probably is a, a petrochemical product. But it doesn't allow, it doesn't track heat the way Remade does, mm -hmm. so, which is why Remade is great for season extension, and you can grow abundant greens early in the season with Remade because it tracks heat. It's like it's like a greenhouse, but it does still allow moisture through, unlike plastic. Mm -hmm. So the other another thing that your your garden needs, of course, is water, and everyone is is concerned about water these days. So there's, there's two things. One is um, drip irrigation. And when you, if you use drip irrigation, when you lay drip irrigation, have lots and lots of turnoffs. Or have the kind of drip irrigation, the one we used to use at the farm, was one where you could just kink it and then put a little bit of um, string around it and you would turn off a whole line. It was fabulous. But have lots and lots of turnoffs because if you take out a row of something, you don't want to be necessarily watering that row, you know, when there's no crop. So ideally each row. Ideally, ideally for each bed yeah. or each row preferably. And the, the community garden has has great drip irrigation. Love it. Can I just suggest a book from the library? It's called Gardening with Less Water, yeah, and it actually has a lot of amazing irrigation techniques that you might not think of, like wicking. Drip, drip irrigation is one of them, but they also recommend over-drip irrigation. You might put mulch, for example, to help retain mm -hmm. water. 
And you can use quite a lot less water using some of the techniques in the book. It's, it's only 120 pages, has tons of pictures, and the, the library has nine copies. So gardening with less water, I, I just highly recommend it for, for learning different irrigation methods. Mm -hmm. We also have a learning experience with drip irrigation last year. When you're getting your piping, don't go with a smaller size. Like if you've got a choice between half inch and five eighths, take the five eighths. Because I had problems with flow rate using, I bought half inch everything. And it's a major problem with flow rates. My header lines needs to be this big and it's this big. So if it, that's a, that's a good lesson. It's a lesson in plumbing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so for instance, if you've, if you've, got, a, if you've got a one inch feed line, and you need to go for a long way, you go to a certain distance, you take it down to three quarters of an inch because you're gonna drop off pressure on the way through. You go down to three quarter of an inch, you use your three quarter of an inch main line to feed into your half inch or your five in eighths, whatever. You just go down a step. If you start with three quarters, get three quarters all the way out and then go down a step. To your, to your five eighths. Is that assuming you're on well and pump or city? Like, is people here on farm? The pressure is standard. So um, it's whatever's coming out of your hose, if it can do at least 15 PSA? Yeah. And, um, PSI. Um, if, it's too, if it's too high, you can get a pressure reducer down to, down to between 15 and 25 PSI. If you put too much pressure through your drip irrigation, it's just going to burst time and time again, yeah. and you're going to end up with huge wet patches and huge mm -hmm. dead crops, and it's going to be very um, disappointing. I'm, I'm considering it for my garden. I've got all raised beds where for Turtle Valley, it's clay and rock. Um, but what I'm looking at doing is I'm looking at putting like a management system because they are all raised beds, so I can zone my garden mm -hmm, off, mm -hmm. and then I don't have to have like this. But, but, it, but even with a manifold system, unless the manifold is, is, is covering a really small area, it's good to have those secondary turn-offs yeah. if, if, if... Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. We learned that when we built our house. Yeah. There's, one, there's one under every sink and toilet. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. And, of course, the other thing is, is, is water catchment. And I did live in a, a place with, with next to no water. And what we had was a, was a kid's swimming pool, mm -hmm. and it used to it used to fill every every so often, and then we would just bucket the water out of the swimming pool. Um, bucketing water is is a pain in the, <laughs> but it's very effective for things like tomatoes, peppers, um, you know, squash, your larger plants. And so don't don't be trying to bucket onto onto carrot seed, for instance. You're you're going to wash it all away. Mm. But yeah. An investment in water, like your water systems, is really crucial. Mm -hmm. Like it makes it so much more enjoyable when you're not actually just feeling mm -hmm. the stress. I got to get it in water. Yes. Just having an investment, and it can be a big investment. So even just slowly building, like even just getting a few good hoses this year. And just at least start getting because drip hoses are preferable to hand watering, hose spraying, and you know watering overnight or something like that. That's where diseases are often born. So drip irrigation is a good investment. It's something to definitely look into. And if you have an automatic overhead watering system, get rid of it. I, you use too much water. Your um, tomatoes are liable to, 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 to get diseased. Mm -hmm. um, it's, everything gets too wet or too dry. Or if you want to grow leeks next to onions, your leeks need water or season. Your onions come the middle of August, no water. You've got an overhead watering system, what the heck are you gonna do? Mm -hmm. You can't turn it off, you can't make it off. Mm -hmm. And those automatic systems, um, it pours with rain for four hours, your system comes on for four hours, and then it doesn't come on for another two days. No, so that, that's the one thing I like to stay away from is, is, is the overhead automatic watering system. If you have to 
um, overhead water at certain times, so be it, but not the automatic systems. Yeah. I didn't get any of this. Okay. <laughs> 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 I was like, those are my onions didn't turn out so many <laughs> overwatering. Yeah. And, you know, some of us have really, really small areas. Really small areas. Some of us have um, sunshine in a little area, and that area just happens to be the side of the pathway going down to wherever, and there's no sun in the rest of the garden. And, and this is where your planters really, really come into play. Because you can take your planter, put your tomato plant in your sunniest area, and you're going to get tomatoes. That's all there is to it. Make sure that you plant a plant that is appropriate for your container. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a great believer in, in uh, indeterminate tomatoes in planters because you don't have to do anything with them. You just stick them in the middle of your garden, they kind of go and you've got tomatoes. Indeterminate, determinate, your determinants. With your indeterminates, you have to stake them. And those are the ones that are great to grow on strings up at the side of your house if you've got a sunny section. You can grow them and you get great production from them. But if you're, if you're stuck with having to put your hot crop in a pot in the middle of your garden somewhere, it's much easier to, to, to go with the, with the indeterminates. I hope I didn't confuse you on that. Mm -hmm. Determinants. Yeah, determinants. Yeah, well, determinants. The determinants. Yeah. The determinants. It means that the determined size will have to give you a determined amount of fruit. Indeterminate is a vine. Mm -hmm. And it just goes and goes and goes and goes until you stop. Indeterminate is, is, is the one that you stake and prune. The, the determinate is the one that grows into a bush. Um, my my daughter-in-law um, owns a seed company, and this year she gave me a tomato, which is specifically designed for growing in the house. So I'm I'm really excited to to, to give that one a trial. She also gave me some bush tomatoes, which look really stunted, but produce a huge crop of really big tomatoes. So I'm really excited to trial those as well. So you can get all kinds of different products. You can get bush cucumbers. You can get trailing beans. You can get bush beans. And usually your plants that grow tall will give you more crop. <coughs> than your plants that grow short. If you're growing in raised beds, you don't necessarily need to trellis upwards. You can allow your crops to run down. I did that with cucumbers last year and it was highly successful. If you have a fence close by, they can run up the fence. As long as you don't have goats. Or dogs that eat your If you have goats, if you have goats, you need their fences. <laughs> well, if you don't want to grow along your fence, because then the animals are coming to it from the outside. Exactly. Exactly. If your neighbor has goats, it's even worse. <laughs> But your, your, your trellising to go up doesn't necessarily need to be something that, that, that you're going to build this year. It, it can be a fence. It can be an apple tree. It can be the side of your compost bins. The, the, other, the other thing that I have seen that I really like is um, a friend of mine had a raised bed about yay high down the side of her house. 
you just put little hooks into the raised bed and little hooks up on the side of her house and she had these strings just running up and down and that's where she grew her beans and, and various other up and down things so you can whatever works for your garden is fine you don't have to say oh, my neighbor's not doing that so it's not good you know whatever works is fine I have a friend who buys a bale of peat moss a year and he lives up the mountain and he takes that bale of peat moss when there's not going to be any more snow and he scatters it over the snow on his garden and it the snow thaws a lot faster than anywhere else so if you live up a mountain think about how am I going to get cropping early if you need to, if you want to. So, we are going to have a seed starting workshop. Oh, oh yeah. Yes, <laughs> yes. So we are going to have a seed starting workshop. But when you're looking at your catalogs and deciding on what seeds you want, you don't need to buy them out of the catalogs that you're looking at. You just need to know that I want a bush bean and this variety sounds great. And go check out the local stores. Seed swap. Seed swap, yes, whatever. End of seed uh, swap should be coming up in March. And supposedly they actually have a seed vault at the library. And there be all the seed swaps, yes. all the seeds yes. and the, the swap are in a, in a place in the library. I, I found, yeah, I found you get very few seeds. Oh, dear. Yeah. yeah. But you can get seeds from the library. Mm -hmm. But I, I haven't been to the end of the one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's. So if you're starting your seedlings, and everybody here is, it must be thinking about gardening because they're here. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to start your seedlings, think about when you're going to start them. Has anybody started anything yet? No. <laughs> I'm growing lettuce <laughs> too, <laughs> and I've got lots of it. And but the thing is, I've got romaine, but it's sort of leafy. It's not growing like this. And I've got artificial light, like grow Eat lights. It. <laughs> <laughs> Start again in the center. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This is my first time doing this, so I'm not. It's all green. Yeah. <laughs> what What are you? Lettuces doing? and spinach. Lettuce and spinach. Yeah. And are you harvesting yours, or are not you? yet? I put it in on the seventh of January. We're not seeing anything yet. Ah. A couple more days, hopefully. Okay. And where have you got it planted? I've got it in seed trays on top of the wardrobe in the living room where the fireplace is. <laughs> It does, but uh, Samara, our, uh, our co-community member, has suggested that it doesn't require light until it is germinated. So. Okay. Some things need light to germinate, but I believe you can do spinach and lettuce without light. Yeah, I'll turn them off. Yeah. yeah. Who else? There was another hand. Eucalyptus. I started after. Sorry? Eucalyptus. Oh, okay. Oh, well, that's cool. Nice. Nice. Well, I'm, I'm really happy that nobody says tomatoes. <laughs> <laughs> Not to and I just took uh, one of those lettuces you buy with the roots on the bottom, mm -hmm. and I cut it off, and then I put that root in the water and just left it in the window, and it's growing nicely. So, 
that's another way to do it that's already started. You can, you can do that with celery, green onions, lettuce, all kinds of things. So anything that's, that's got root or is likely to root, all you need on the bottom of the celery is, is you know, even the hint of a root, and it, 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 could, it could grow for you. Yeah, yeah. So what are people thinking of starting from seed, are you thinking of starting tomato, your own tomatoes? Yeah. 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 Tomatoes, peppers, watermelons. Okay. Yeah. I'm trying to have for the first time this year. Okay, and, and we all know to read the back of our seed packages. Yeah. <laughs> or use the wonderful planting guide in the West Coast seed catalogs that people have handed out. I used to start, um, onions from seed and always started them. I, they were never successful to be planted in the field. But I always started them from seed. They need to be started in March sometime. Um, I planted celery probably too early last year because we had little success with it at the community garden. It all went to seed. And I think that what happened was that um, it was a really cold spring last year, and and the, the celery vernalized before it was planted. So it all went to seed. So you do have to be careful with, with some of that. There are some, some plants, um, the one that comes to mind is red chard. Red chard is terrible from going to seed if you, if you plant it too early. But the other chards are okay. <clears throat> so, uh, I'd like to experiment this year, uh, starting with the seeds, uh, the standard, you know, broccoli and cabbage and tomatoes and so on, get those plants started in February. Um, also, I'd like to do some corn, beans, that sort of thing. I'd like maybe a dozen corn plants that I can get up six or eight inches and then plant it out in the garden. Yeah. Just to give me a, a small crop so we start early. We used to plant all of our corn by, by, by transplant. Uh-huh. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, it, uh, it protects the crows from eating the seed. Okay. Mind you, the pheasants used to eat the corn, so it wasn't really worth it. <laughs> <laughs> but what you need to do is you just need to think about if, if the seed package says to put in the soil um, when it's warmed up. It's usually about your May the 24th. So you don't really want to start your corn until May the 1st. With your beans, there are some varieties that say that they are cold tolerant. And so a cold tolerant bean, you could plant earlier than that. But one that is not cold tolerant I wouldn't plant until the, the last week in April or so, because they rot. You put them into the cold soil and they rot. And that's really disappointing too. So there are some things that you can put in really, really early. And they are, and I'm talking about putting into the ground as a seed. You can put out um, lettuce, arugula, a lot of the mustard greens, salad turnips, um, certain beets, peas, broad beans. I'm sure people can think about this. Those ones can go out into the garden really, really early. What's really, really early? As soon as you can, work, soon the as you can work the soil. Okay. If you're worried about your soil being too waterlogged, a hint, take your digging implement, dig up a piece of soil, take a handful in your bare hand, squeeze it, drop it. If it goes, you can work your soil. If it stays like a tennis ball, wait another week. Okay. That's, yeah, but as soon as your soil can be worked, you can put plants into the garden. Um, 
And again, when you put your crop into the garden, think also about succession planting. How much arugula is my family really going to weed in a week? Are they going to eat one bunch, two bunches, three bunches? How many feet do I need? Like, you only need about that much for five, six bunches of arugula. So that is an awful lot usually for a single family. So I'm going to plant this much arugula, this much lettuce, mm -hmm. a few salad turnips, whatever. And then a couple of weeks later, you're going to plant that much arugula, that much lettuce, that much salad turnips. Oh, I forgot the spinach. I've got to plant spinach. Do I like frozen food? If you like frozen food, if you want to, I won't say it, maybe even like frozen food, but if you want to process some of your food for use in the winter, what are you going to process? Tomatoes. Lots of them. For me, it's tomatoes. Carrot. Carrot. Zucchini. Brats. Beets. Peppers. Onions. <laughs> Which kind? Curry. 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 My favorite. It's our favorite too. My favorite. Yes. Red curry smoke. Yeah. yeah. Right on. So when you're when you're thinking about planting for succession, you also need to think about planting for um, your your winter needs. If you're going to grow spinach, think about oh, we're going to um Frida's wedding in September and we won't be home again until the end of October. So I can't grow full spinach. I can only grow spring spinach this year. Yeah. I want some for freezing, put it in early. The, the, the same, oh my goodness, I'm going away, you know, for the Easter weekend at the cottage and blah, blah, blah. I'm not gonna have time to freeze all that spinach and all those peas. Oh well, no frozen peas this year and We'll do the spinach in the fall. Spinach will not grow in the summer. Very well. You can grow spinach to baby, but you're not going to be growing freezing spinach in the summer. Can I, I just want to add a uh, comment on, you have three different seasons, really, to grow a garden. So if you miss spring, you, can, you still have summer and fall. And if you miss, I mean, except for your long crops. Like if you are going to plant tomatoes, starting early. If you miss it and you didn't grow enough in the spring, you still have fall. We seem to have extended falls now. So I mean, every year is going to be a little different. But um, you can certainly do an, almost an entirely new garden at the end of summer. Yes, you can. And get an entirely new flush of greens. And well, when you're learning how to read the seed packs, you know, they have their maturity, dates to maturity. So that's where you're kind of doing your, your, your going backwards. But as you're looking at winter um, harvest too, um, the best tasting carrots I have are coming out of the ground right now. Mm -hmm. yeah. So wow. you don't have to grow everything to harvest and freeze and have enough for winter. If you have the space to actually plant some of your root crops um, and even potatoes, that's, and beets are a little hit or miss, you can take your chances. Um, you can actually plan to leave them in the ground the entire winter and then just dig them up as you need them. And come spring, you will have fresh carrots, fresh parsnips. Um, pota the potatoes that I pulled out of the ground last year were so sweet in April that it was hard to actually eat them. I had to add a lot of salt. Like, there was just so much sugar in them. But the carrots right now are amazing. So you don't have to have a full storage. You can just use the soil. There's techniques that you would learn how to make sure that they don't freeze. Um, so if you have problems with rodents, you're gonna have to figure out that, like how do you protect them from rodents? But that is completely possible too as you plan for the winter. So,
once it, once it, once you've got your once you've got your 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 garden plan <coughs> and the planting guide in West Coast Seeds is the premium planting guide. It really is. Mm -hmm. It's it's something it's something that we used on the farm constantly, and we were meant to be experts. So it's something we used all the time. The does anybody have any questions at this point? I have a question about my greenhouse. I was yeah. just laying out of mm -hmm. uh, you know, sliding glass doors. And so it's amazing, but it's way too hot. Okay. So how do I make it not so hot? Like, is there a film I can buy? Like, it's so hot. It's like, it's way too hot. So things were just not growing like they should because they were just too hot. And I just had peppers and tomatoes in there. Okay. Okay. I have a fan going constantly in there, but it's just not enough. It's so 100% open, south facing, like just like scorcher. Like I can fry it. So you can buy um, a black cloth. Okay, black cloth. It's a black cloth that goes on the top um, of your greenhouses. Um, I know it's available from CY Growers in Abbotsford. Although it may be uh, a little big, I don't know. Um, we always bought for large greenhouses. But the light doesn't come out. Sorry? Yeah. What about the light that grows? Yeah. yeah. There is enough light going through. There is enough light going through. It's like an open weave cloth. So, so, and it's, it's, it's a little bit raised so that, so that it has constant shade. So, oh, so that. It's yeah, like plastic yeah. Almost. It's yeah. It's a shape. It's a shape. Okay. But can I put that on the yeah. side as well? Because it's too hot, like coming in the side. Oh, definitely. Well. So there's a whole thing I could do. Yeah, okay. absolutely, Thank absolutely. You. Um, you can. Um, I think it's a lime wash. You can actually wash so it, because you have a glass greenhouse. Mm -hmm. You could actually put a lime wash on your greenhouse, and then in the uh, in the spring, you can just take a hose and wash it off. Oh, which yeah. will which will prevent the the the, uh, the light going through. Um, the other thing that you need to think about is that hot air rises, and is there is there any way, um, like maybe when you built the greenhouse, um, you should have thought about putting um, some kind of, of of gap. There is. There is a gap. Yeah, on both ends. Yeah, it's just so hot, and it's that sun tech. Um, on top, so the SunTech, you know, roofing milky is on top, but it, I think it's just those, the south facing, wide open, all the time, no trees anywhere around, and just, it's just baking at all, like, so no trees, clear glass. No trees anywhere around, you, no. could, you, could, you could plant mm. to protect. Mm. I could put my peach trees there that never work in the orchard. You yeah. could do that, or <laughs> okay. or you could put um, indeterminate indi indi tomatoes staked on the outside on the south side. So something that is tall and heat loving. Okay. So um, a temporary. A temporary fence that you could grow cucumbers, squash, melons <laughs> on would also help to protect from the side. So you're a genius. Genius. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. That's perfect. Those are good ideas. Good ideas. Yeah. I'll do yeah, a couple of those. Down down on the coast we did the opposite because it's so it's so um, cool and miserable down on the coast such a lot of the time. And we actually had our grapes growing outside the greenhouse. And then we slid them underneath and grew the grapes themselves inside the greenhouse. So the grape roots got the right temperature that they wanted. And then the, the grapes got the temperature that they wanted. So all kinds of things you can think of. Thank you. So it is 3 o'clock. And like, there's so many topics, right? There's so much to know. And we'll continue breaking down things into parts and pieces. And like the seed starting, there's so much to know even about that. And 
working like summer growing. Like now that things are getting so hot, how how are you going to keep growing a successful garden? How do you manage smoke from wildfires? Like that really affects crops. We've talked a little bit about irrigation, so you know, like that will be an entire other thing too. Um, Can you do so a greenhouse one, Mel? Absolutely. So have to find the, the example to teach it too. But yeah, and so as we move into the uh, warmer weather, we will look to do things on site too. Like we would prefer in the end to do workshops actually at the community teaching garden where people can do hands-on learning. We can do tomato growing workshops and or any other summer crops and you know those flea beetles. <laughs> we can't grow like arugulas and tapsoids and any kind of green because they're just devastated by flea beetles. So we just don't grow those there. Where's your garden? Are your this is the teaching garden is in North Broadview, so all the way kind of towards the end where you turn off to go to Canoe uh, Beach. So it's up there. It's lovely. Parking, bathroom, mm -hmm. water, mm -hmm. space. Well, oh, is it? It's not the green place. The, the nursery. Oh, no, 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 it's further down on the left. Oh, it's yeah. down there where we like McDonald's and the co op. Yeah, like past the Acres, past Elk Hall. Towards Canoe. Um, canoe, so canoe. Yeah. 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 They're all the way at the end of 30th. So it's a lovely spot. We will definitely do workshops up there too. And if you have ideas on workshops that you would like to learn, please just uh, email me and, and I'll keep looking for instructors. Mm -hmm. So unless, did you have some more that you wanted to talk about today? All, all I want to say is that I don't know everything and you are never going to get to know everything. Mm -hmm. either. <laughs> because yeah. gardening is a real learning curve. Yeah. And when in doubt, just put it in and give it a try. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Sarah Bradshaw, and uh, as most of you may know, Sarah Bradshaw left us this uh, about three weeks ago. And I had worked with Sarah going on 11 years. Uh, I was a video um, uh, videographer with her for many years. I, I glammed on to Sarah because she knew how to grow food, and she knew how to store it, and she knew how to prepare it. And I wanted to learn that, and so I spent most of my time videoing her just for my own personal. But she, uh, she left us early enough that she had already um, created the calendar and the, uh, the date book for 2023. And some of you I know already have yours. But for those of you who do not currently have a biodynamic planning calendar, this is available for you. She's got so much information. She also has a planting guide <laughs> and a seed saving guide. Uh, the seed saving thing gets a little crazy, like you need to have a hundred or fifty to a hundred spinach in order to start uh, collecting some seeds so it gets a little crazy but it's got all the distances it's got the nighttime temperatures and it's got all that but each day tells you the activities that would work well for that day uh, January 1st obviously uh, planting rootstock wasn't happening <laughs> but maybe we could go work in our cold storage and work with our rootstock and see what we're going to be doing next year um, so it has a little legend on the bottom or in the top for the calendar. So it's a planting day and it's a root day. Today is the 15th. Today's a good day for leaf or stem day. So whatever that means to you. It gets a little bit more pertinent as you move on into the, uh, the gardening season, like in April. It's Things an entirely like other realm of gardening. It is really, really all gardening. And it also gives you the astrology for the day because believe it or not, certain plants have certain astrological signs that they go well with. So this tells you so you don't have to remember. It's like, are we in Taurus or are we in Aries? Anyway, it's all there. She has so much information gathered. Like she said something about 15 books for all the information that she puts in these. And I'm sure some of the West Coast seeds pull from the same places. 
Now the calendar is great for a, a passing glance, but the date book gives you all the information plus plus plus, but it gives you places to write down what you did that day. And I have three of these now from the last three years of gardening, and I can go back at the Sunny Bray Teaching Garden and figure out what I did right, what I did wrong, what was planted there. I always do a map every year of my garden, and I keep it updated with everything that goes in. But this helps keep me organized, because I didn't write down on the lettuce plants when I planted them, so I go to my book and say, okay, they're not coming up yet. That's because it hasn't been 14 days yet. It's only been nine. I'm freaking out for no reason. But it's also good for someone who walks into the garden because now next year I'm not going to be at the Sunny Bray Teaching Garden, but the person who is has all my notes from last year. And it's all sitting there and ready for it. So for those of you who have not got your calendar or date book yet, these are 35. It's also got a ton of stuff on the goddess, uh, becoming one with the goddess. And it's got lots of coloring and drawing and stuff like that. I like the date book because it's fun. And I've never shied away from being, you know, familiar with my feminine, so no problem with that. You can have these, they've got them over on the table there. Yeah, I'm going to bring them over. I do believe Melanie is offering the seeds. These are probably a couple years old, yeah. so germination rates will be down. Um, Melanie doesn't feel right charging full pot for them, no. so donations we'll, will be gratified. Yeah, we'll, so I got two packs. Sarah gave these to the garden. <coughs> she was very generous. I was very sad to have this happen because she's a real asset to the seed saving community. She was passionate and that's one of those things that we're kind of, that's the challenge, is finding those passionate individuals who will keep steering projects. And so like Michael was still working with people who were a part of Wise Women Seeds and she was really instrumental in um, the Enderby Seed Saving Group too. So we're really hoping that other people will kind of follow in and, and keep working with what she was trying to do. The end of seed saving, which is interesting, is that the local library is now looking to do a seed library. So, you know, if we can find some people who want to work together on that, we can actually get our own salmon arms seed saving library, and, you know, it would be a great memorial, too. So, we encourage you to please take some seeds today. Hopefully they work for you. You might get a couple plants out of each pack, and you can have a, a little space in your garden that we can just honor a person who really tried to make a difference in, in the food security realm by saving seeds and teaching people. So those are free. And then what we'll do today is a portion of today's proceeds will go towards continuing on her work too. Good. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. I know it's going to be a little hard to try and grab seeds. Um, lots of beans. <laughs>